Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Christina Hoff Summers. And I'm Danielle Crittenden. Welcome back, Christina. We missed you last week. How's your mom? She's doing okay. Not great, but okay. So I'm going to be commuting back and forth to Portland for a while. Right. We had our, as you know, our good friend Megan on, co-splaining. She I know. was a lot. <laughs> she was pretty good. I you, felt <laughs> you had an all about Eve moment. I did like this young upstart coming in here doing a better job than you know. I thought she was great, and I want to have her on more. Yeah, and the topic was great too. What I did save for you was the reaction we had to our discussion of traditional and non-traditional marriage. We got a lot of great listener feedback, so we can talk about that after our guest today, who is Margaret Hoover, the phenomenal, beautiful, brilliant Margaret Hoover, who restarted Bill Buckley's firing line. But we'll talk about her in a second because I want to talk about the big glass ceiling which you I broke shattered. this week. I you shattered. shattered it. The first woman in herstory <laughs> to appear on the Ben Shapiro Sunday special. He's had a man, never a woman. Why has he there. not had a woman? Well, he's, no, it's just, I think he's only had six episodes. <laughs> oh, okay. It's a special Sunday show that he does for an hour. So I went there. I know you've tried to explain this to me, but isn't he part of the dark web? Yes. What is the dark the web? It sounds so dark web. sinister. It does. It's a joke, I mean, to call it that. But it's just a sort of dissident scholars and journalists who say things that depart from the liberal consensus or the, the sort of academic orthodoxy. And Ben's a li- the most conservative. I would say the majority are liberal or, like me, sort of politically homeless. And the Weinsteins and Ayan Hirsi Ali. Well, I just think they shouldn't call it, though, the dark web when you're on, because it's really the more brunette, dirty, blonde blonde, web. Blonde, blonde wannabe (laughs) web. (laughs) Well, what did you talk, like, what was it like? He's so accomplished that he has, like, video cameras in his studio. and He puts us to shame. And, you know, he doesn't just do a podcast. He does a podcast. It's a video in front of an audience. A like, live audience? Yeah. He oh, come wow. by, well, he doesn't always do that. But I like him so much because, like, for a parent, mm-hmm. he's like a knockus machine. I mean, just knockus is the Yiddish word for the special joy children give their parents. He's a violin virtuoso. He could have gone to Juilliard a minute, mm-hmm. and then goes to UCLA at a very young age, and then to Harvard Law School, and then now he has this Ben Shapiro empire. And he's just very Yeah, how, how old is he? He's like 12, 13? He's 12 or 13. Does he shave yet? <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I forget how old he is, but he's very young. Uh, yeah. But he's married and has kids. And I think he did the honorable thing and left Breitbart at a time when it was becoming right. problematic and welcoming to the alt-right. And then he became a target for hate mail and, you know, just abuse. And I think he was selected as the reporter who got the most abuse of all. And terrible anti-Semitic. He's an Orthodox Jew, so people were... That's right. I remember that. It's happened to me a little bit. But anyway, he's very good. And he's, you know, question after question. And uh, I was able to cover a lot of material and have a good time. And I was in a cocktail. There were no cocktails. Oh, so we still have... But you know what I did? As soon as I left, I went to a cafe, bar, restaurant. It was called the Public Library. No, the Public School. That I'd have to do homework or something, but it's like books and chalkboards, but it's a bar. And I had my. Were the bartenders armed? <laughs> <laughs> I had two Proseccos and then went to LAX. Oh. Came home on the red eye, which was something I used to do in college 100 years ago. And, you know, I just go inside to curl up with a book. It was torture. Yeah. I couldn't sleep. And I, after two hours, I thought, what am I going to do? Anyway, I'm not doing a red eye again. Okay, well, good. Well, we're glad to have you back. Really missed you. And best wishes to your mom. I hope she's listening to the podcast. She listens. Well, please feel better. We're thinking about you. Okay, so Margaret Hoover. We've known her a long time. Forever. Forever. When we had Ayan Hersia Leon, and we were talking about hanging out, going to bars with Ayan in New York, Margaret was often one of our partners in crime. She was one of our partners in crime. And this is a person who ordinarily you'd be annoyed with her because she's perfect. She's brilliant. She's beautiful. She's married with two kids and has not just a full-time job, a fantastic job. And she's married to John Avlon. Who is movie star handsome. Movie star. They're both movie stars. They're both, yes. Yeah. And so, they're both brilliant. So, like, at one time I was in Cambridge and I, I took this friend of mine who was at Harvard to visit this Orthodox Jewish aunt in my family. And this older aunt was listening to my friend and my friend said, 
you know, she was getting her PhD in English at Harvard, and, but she'd sold a screenplay in Hollywood and she was getting married. It was all this great stuff. And finally, this aunt was getting a little overwhelmed by it and said, so tell me, what do you do for aggravation? <laughs> So we we'll have, have, we'll have to ask her, because it all looks so perfect. I know. Oh, we didn't even say she's a, a president's great-granddaughter. I want to find out about that. Her newest thing is to become host of a revived or restarted firing line, which was the old PBS show that was hosted by William F. Buckley, one of right. the most famous conservatives of all time, dashing, and a, and a clever. show that lasted longer than any other. People grew up with that. It, my dad was very liberal. But he liked Buckley. Yeah. Everybody liked Buckley. Yeah. Except Gore Vidal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she's just started that. That's on PBS. We're going to have to ask her what she does for aggregation because she's also a best-selling author. Yeah, yeah. She, she, she's, she's also very not. She's so likable. So oh, no. She, I, she, mad at her she is so, she and John are like two of the most charming people right. together. It's like the wattage is so bright in the room. It's, it's hard it's to hard. be there with that <laughs> sunglasses on. The book is called. American Individualism, How a New Generation of Conservatives Can Save the Republican Party. That came out in 2011, so I'm not sure they listened to her. But the point is, she's always been this very modern, liberal-minded Republican. She worked very heavily on the gay marriage campaign. She is a CNN commentator. She was on Bill Riley's show before. Oh, didn't she have a fight with him? Yeah, she was. I think she had lots of fun. Anyway, she's a really, really interesting person. We're excited to have her on. Let's bring her on. Margaret, welcome to the Femsplainers. Hi, Hi, Margaret. Hi, Christina and Danielle. So nice to be with you both. It's so great to have you. I understand your little son, Jack, is sitting next to you with his iPad. He is, and I'm not proud of it. <laughs> Why? He's in the office well, with you? I'm not proud that he's on his iPad, but this is the oh. only way he could come see Neil deGrasse Tyson was if I took him home, and the only way I could take him home was if he sat here with me in the studio while I chatted with you all. Wait a minute. So you took him to work to see Neil deGrasse Tyson? My husband brought him to the end of my taping to see <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson and meet me, but he had to go to a meeting, so Jack is coming home with me. And is oh. Jack a fan? Jack is a, plan- a fan of planets and space and oh. astrophysics. We're happy to have him on as a future mansplainer, too, should he, should he break in. But, Margaret, so tell us about the show. We talked a little bit about it before you came on, but you restored, revived the iconic Firing Line show of yeah, William take, F. Yeah, take a non this, the throne of the legendary William F. Buckley. How does that feel? Well, no one can really <laughs> take on the legendary William F. Buckley or, or assume his throne. But I have revived the show and in the hopes of reviving the tradition of a rigorous exchange of ideas on television. And that's the highest and best hope. And I think we've had some good moments so far. We're off to a good start. We're in 91% of the country and 165 markets on public television markets. These are all local stations where local programmers make a decision whether or not to carry the program. So it's been met with a degree of success, and many people in the public television world are very happy about it. Return to public Well, there was an amazing success right away when you interviewed Alexandria (laughs) Ocasio-Cortez. It made headlines. CNN had a big story about it and other places because... She's the congressional candidate for New York City's, what is it, the 14th congressional yep, district? Yep, New York 14, congressional district 14. And she tell us what happened. Joe Crowley, who was slated to potentially take over as the leader of the Democrats in the House of Representatives should they win back the House of Representatives in November. So it was a sort of a Dave Bradley moment, I think. The, the defeat of Eric Cantor, I think, was probably the last event like this that was met with similar heraldry. Your interview made news. It did. I mean, we did make news. I asked her questions that she hadn't been asked. This is the value of the format, is that we have 26 minutes and 45 seconds. We have 30 minutes, essentially. And in rare, she has done, before she did Firing Line, before she came to the Firing Line, she had participated. I had watched at least a dozen interviews that she had done on television, various cable news outlets, MSNBC, CNN, all these different shows, Univision. I watched her in Spanish. I watched her in English. And the difference is the format. We've got 30 minutes to go back and forth with somebody and really dive Mm -hmm. deep and be able to determine how much knowledge they have, how much insight they have, how much they've really thought about the issues and where they're coming from. I think it was revelatory to many people because they got a sense of exactly what she thinks about capitalism and exactly what she thinks about the state of Israel and exactly what she thinks about 
socialism and our democratic republic. And in some cases, I think it was interesting. It set off its own life online and in the analysis of the show based on what was really the advantage of being able to ask her questions that nobody had asked her before and then being able to follow up and then being able to follow up again. And she was holding forth about Israel and how occupying the Palestine and <laughs> talking about housing. And, so, and you just pressed her. And then uh, to her credit, she did something I haven't seen many politicians do. She says, well, I really don't know much about in the Middle East. But she had to admit that to you. Right. You did a very yeah. good job with the follow-up questions without being aggressive or unpleasant. <laughs> so it's sort of retro in that way. And this is, I guess, the part of the old firing line that you're picking up is it's like 30 minutes, as you say, but of ideas. It's going beyond or back, retreating from the soundbite television, which honestly, I can't even watch anymore. I can't either. It's just everybody, even today with everything that's going on in politics, it's just very frustrating because most shows you have two minutes most to talk about something with three different bobbing heads, and you really don't get to get into the issues the way you're doing. Is and, it? And, I, and I go on Twitter so I can get more in-depth analysis. <laughs> we know you're a Twitter addict, Christina. <laughs> what else did you take away from the Buckley shows that you admired and want to bring into your version of Firing Line? Well, the other thing we're doing is actually using Buckley shows in my version of Firing Line. So the 1,505 episodes were filmed of Firing Line, and they're all at the Hoover Institution. No relation? <laughs> in, in addition to being a, a public policy institute, it was founded by my great-grandfather as a archive. It was actually called a war library, and it is, it is the, one of the largest private archival repositories of political material related to 20th century politics hmm. and human events. And so there is this you know, vast archival collection there, and amongst the collections is the Firing Line collection. And so we're able to use clips from original Firing Lines in every single episode, and that's probably my favorite part of every episode because what it can also do is highlight how our debates in many cases haven't changed at all, how almost every issue, any issue or topic that we want to discuss, debate, unpack on our firing line has been touched on in a previous firing line. I mean, there are 33 years of them once a week. There are 1,500 episodes. Buckley talked about everything. Extraordinary yeah. guest over the course of 33 years. So last week we had Pastor J.D. Greer, who's the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and we showed him a clip of Billy Graham talking mm -hmm. about how he balances politics and preaching. Frankly, J.D. Greer, the pastor, the current pastor, newly elected, 45 years old, young, fresh face, new voice for the evangelical movement in this country and 16 million evangelicals in this country lamented that evangelicals in this country have become so politicized and that if the convention itself returned to the relationship it had with politics at the time that Billy Graham was on the show, which was in 1969, they would have a much healthier relationship with American politics and government. We can use actual clips from Firing Line and Buckley's initial insights and extend their lesson mm -hmm. to comment on our contemporary events, our current events, or also to highlight where movements have changed over time or where they have, frankly, proven themselves correct. It's a tool, actually, that can ground the show both in its history and ground these arguments. You know, a lot of the old shows are on YouTube, and I occasionally will watch them because they're so fantastic. To see him debating Noam Chomsky or sparring with Gore Vidal and, well, and <laughs> Norman Mailer. To your point about the history, Margaret, is... One of the things I notice that has become a pundit line <laughs> right now is people are going like, has it ever been this bad? Has the country ever been so divided? And never in our history. And then actually the parallel, which is always brought up, is 1968, and it was worse. And Buckley was a central figure at the Democratic Convention, correct? That's right. I mean, there was, I think you're referring to the Best of Enemies. There was a right. well documented episode in the documentary film Best of Enemies. With Gore Vidal, where he was doing commentary with Gore Vidal. Bill Buckley to the convention as, yes, as debaters. So that wasn't Firing Line. That was, that was a part, separate and apart from Firing Line. But, I, but Buckley had been doing Firing Line for two years by then. And so they believed that he'd be the best conservative commentator. It's representative of a moment where the split screen started. Well, right, and the split country that, started. So, well, right, not well, that, at that media, round. The split screen, the split screen started. But you're right, is ABC didn't have a, a marketing budget for the convention in 1968. And so what they do, they brought on two people who could mix it up and deal the ratings all by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then maybe perhaps it was that moment that created sort of these 
hyperbolic talking head, you know, he said, she said, mm -hmm. left said, right said, idiotic discourse that, that has become cable news. On the other hand, Buckley himself did something very different for 33 years on mm -hmm. television. And it doesn't quite capture that paradox either. He'd be irritated by guests. And I recall in the interview with Noam Chomsky, Chomsky had said he thought certain debates shouldn't take place. They're beneath your humanity. And I think that included appearing on firing line. <laughs> and then Buckley said, so why are you here? And then he sort of said, well, it could be instructive for people to know. What the the wryness, the wittiness. And, and, the, <laughs> and, then, and then got his the, voice well. And at some point, why, yeah. in a very elegant way, Buckley said, but if you do that, sir, I, could, I might punch you in the face. <laughs> and then he had a smile and looked very, and they went on like that. It was just, it's fantastic to watch these two people sparring together. In addition to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you had Jordan Peterson. How was that? Jordan Peterson was great. Jordan Peterson, I mean, that's a terrible answer. Great and nice are sort of the two worst answers ever. Jordan Peterson, I found to be a very compelling guest. He grappled with one or two of my questions, which was all I could hope for. No, I thought you were great. I watched it. And, and what's interesting is he, he never changes. He is the same way in an interview on, you know, on Firing Line as he is on stage, as he is on his videos. That's who he is. What threw him from his normal stage. I, Christine, I'll, I'll be interested to see if you think this is the case, but I, I was curious what he would say on the God question, and that's one where he had to pause, because I think the question was... Who wouldn't have to pause? <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> no, <true. laughs> if you're too confident, oh, you come... God. And I, I heard him. I, mean, I, I know others have told me that he, he's evasive, and in a debate recently, Sam Harris sort of cornered him, but my yep. late husband was originally an Orthodox rabbi who found it impossible to believe but then it found it impossible not to believe. And he was, so I've, I've very close to people who are conflicted. And that's how I see Jordan Peterson. So, so you asked him about his belief conflicted. in God? The question is, why not take that on? I mean, if you're the leading public intellectual on the right in the first part of the 21st century, like, why not take on the God question? I don't think he would say he's on the right. He certainly wouldn't, but he is heralded by the right. But I think also by some liberals and Libertarian. Well, I, I want to you... know what he said. What did he say? <laughs> <laughs> you can never. You, it's no, impossible. To your pen. You can't summarize. What, uh, <laughs> but no, when you asked him and he paused, what did he do? I said, "Why not take on the question of God?" Here you are debating Sam Harris, the leading atheist of the right. early part of the 21st century, and you're a clinical psychologist that deals with sort of the human condition, and you won't answer the question of whether you, whether there's a God or not. And by the way, your 12 rules for life and all of your teachings about morality, and you draw on religion and the stories of the Bible explicitly. So do you believe in God? Did he end Why up ever he... answering or just going... He paused and then I said, is it because you're still reflecting? He said, yeah, of course. There are a bunch of Reddit posts saying that that was sort of a new, for people who really follow him and follow every response he's given, there was something, there was something that felt a little new in that response to some Peterson followers. Does he appeal to women at all? He appeals to me. <laughs> Do I count? You have certain affections for for nerdy, yeah. dark, webby guys. I like the dark, webby guys. I like Ben. I like him. <laughs> and I understand him. I'm not a, you know, a mystical thinker. Or I'm not interested really in Carl Jung and mm -hmm. archetypes of the collective unconscious. But I know that tradition, though it's not mine. I just think he's an excellent expositor and coming to young people, especially young men, and asking deep questions. I mean, if you go to his speeches, he's not, people think, oh, he's the alt-right and he's talking politics. There's very little politics. It's almost all serious sort of well, existential. Uh, my bottom line would be, is he making men better boyfriends and husbands? Is, it, is he bringing the sexes together? I would think so. What do you think, I think Margaret? the answer to that is yes. But I think to many women, it's unclear why. If their rooms are cleaner, it's already better. <laughs> yeah, they're putting on a clean shirt. They're brushing their teeth. They're getting up in the morning. They're getting a job. They're taking responsibility for their lives. I mean, there are people who really swear that he's changed their lives. A lot of people. Really I wanted to be a better person. I heard his lecture, and I was with a bunch of women. And then this was in Washington, D.C. last June, I guess. I really would urge people who are skeptical to listen to one of his lectures. It is unbelievable how the left is so frightened of him. Well, that, because they'll have him. to clean, well, make you, their beds. And they'll have to make their beds. What lecture would you recommend starting with, Christina? I would say the interview, just a chat between him and Camille Paglia is fantastic. Oh, yeah. 
How did I not see that? I need to see that. You need to see it. And I loved it. And that's where I started. She told me about him. And I've met him a couple of times. In whatever you say about him, he's very sincere. He's a little cantankerous and doesn't always, as you saw, he will not tailor his views for a particular audience. He just there there he is. Somewhat like Victor Frankl or or one of the existentialists and grappling with the deepest problems and having this kind of heroic idea about the human adventure. I think there's so is, many young people that are starved for meaning. This is getting way too above my head. Okay. I can't right. I can't follow this existential. Do you think stuff he's beyond he's making cute? it? No. I, 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 he's I, a I Canadian. He's a Canadian. We're proud. We're proud. <laughs> Please join the Femsplainers. Yes, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or your favorite podcast hangout. And follow us on Instagram at the Femsplainer Podcast. And find the Femsplainers on Facebook and Twitter at Femsplainers. And learn all about us at Femsplainers.com. Thank you. Be a Femsplainer. We are talking to Margaret Hoover. On the Femsplainers. Margaret, did you ever actually meet Bill Buckley? Did you ever have a chance to meet him? Sadly, I didn't. I'm really, really saddened about it. I actually went with my husband when I had moved to New York. I actually, my husband felt really dutiful about attending his funeral because he had mm-hmm. been to his house several times. And mm-hmm. he, he, my husband had been to Yale. And of course, you know how Buckley was with students from Yale. He had that and, same affinity for my husband, David, for the Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't. I think he had an affinity for David. I don't think he had deep affinity for my husband. To be clear, I don't think he they they knew each other that well. But he had generosity and magnanimous spirit. Had in, included my husband in, in a number of times that, in sort of larger events and visits in his home or whatever. So I went with my husband to some one of the activities surrounding the funeral, and that's as close as I got. I, I just missed him, really, truly, in terms of ships crossing in the night. I think me moving to New. I wasn't. I hadn't barely been in New York when he passed away. I've gotten to know his son a little bit, Chris Buckley, who's been very supportive of the show. And I've been quite grateful for that. And he's lovely. He's written Privately maybe the funniest. And, and publicly very I funny. love his books. So, his, thank his you memoir, for smoking. <laughs> but his memoir of his dad <laughs> and mother, it, it was a beautiful book, but it was weepingly funny. I mean, it was such a, a vivid Hilarious. portrait of living with these two fascinating, slightly crazy people. Slightly crazy, brilliant people. When did you find out yeah, that your great grandfather you was president of the United States. <laughs> What's that like? Did I didn't you know him? him? He died in 1964. I know, oh, I know. But at some point, somebody said, "You know, your great grandfather lived in the White House." You know, we went to the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum in West Branch, Iowa, every summer growing up. There was always this sort of exercise and ritual and going to the grave site and paying respects, especially in the earlier part of my life when. You know, people like Barry Goldwater were still alive and would be there. And it was an important sort of tribute for conservatives in this country to to stop by and, and pay respects to Herbert Hoover's presidential library around the time of his birth date in August, which is something that happens every year still. So I was I was very young when I knew that there was you know somebody who preceded me who had been important in the course of human events. I was always taught to treat that with reverence, respect, and to also know that it didn't make me special. <laughs> well, it does kind of make you special. I mean, I would think whether it's in your genetic makeup or the way you've approached politics, because one of the things that you've done, and, and including in your best selling book, is you were trying to modernize the Republican Party. You, you've been a prominent activist for gay rights. You know, you are a self described feminist. You were very important to the debate on marriage. And then we look at where the Republican Party is today under Trump. How do you feel about that? And, and does it ever occur to you, gee, maybe I want to be a Democrat? Maybe that was I, I, every pointless. Every word I wrote, and I couldn't have been more overtaken by events. <laughs> well, yeah, join the club. If only they'd listen to Margaret. Yes. How do you feel now about that Republican identity and everything you've worked for over these years? So a couple things. I mean, overwhelmingly, I'm very sad. I'm very sad that the Republican tradition, the one that I identify with and relate to, feels incredibly remote and far, far off, maybe irretrievable. I don't know. There's a sort of open question there. Parties are vehicles for ideas, and they can be vehicles for ideas for a certain amount of time, and then they can stop being vehicles for those ideas. But, you know, the ideas are still important. So the ideas I still stand by. Classical liberalism, the tradition of democracy and free speech and due process. Well, and you were of the compassionate conservative side. 
I'm not so sure I would call myself a compassionate conservative only because of what it became. <laughs> well, right. But these days, anybody who doesn't punch someone in the face much. is a compassionate conservative. I'm a, I'm a what Deirdre McCloskey calls the fabulous economist, a bleeding heart libertarian. I but, call myself a bleeding heart conservative. It's yeah. Yeah. Liber- yeah. Because I, I really care about people, but I just I don't think the way you express that is by spending. And I don't think that socialism is the answer. The ideas that your great grandfather stood for and that you were writing about in your book, these are still relevant. Speaking of crazy times, you were deputy finance director of Rudy Giuliani, his campaign for president. I remember being a big supporter of the Giuliani I remember campaign. when I thought he was so cool. When he was the mayor and, and through 9-11 and, and what an extraordinary person he was. And then what happened? Do you, do you still see him? I know. It's, it's actually, that's also upsetting. Maybe Rudy Giuliani is a, a metaphor or a parody of what's happened to the Republican Party, truly, because, you know, at one time he represented this great tradition of urban conservative mayors in America. He created it by, almost or revived it in an incredible yeah, way. He, and and, and but it wasn't it wasn't just him. I mean, Rudy was the leader of the biggest city who did this. But there was Jack Goldsmith in Indianapolis and there was Dick Reardon in Los Angeles. And yeah, Dick- there was this sort of wave of. I don't know, maybe they were like the early modern conservatives, right? They were the mm-hmm. Northeastern conservatives and Republicans. And they were the putting those ideas the and policies into practice, you know, the broken windows, the arresting people who jump over turnstiles because that's how you find even, you know, guiltier criminals. Also through 9-11 when he would visit, I think he went to maybe 20 funerals in 24 hours. I mean, he was just tireless on standing up for the city and, and the people who had suffered in it. And I don't know who that person now on TV is impersonating him. I think what it comes down to, I mean, my observation is, is a little different. I mean, I, I was never in his inner circle. Some people very close to Some me. Some people very close to was. Me. One of the characteristics that require, is, is absolutely required to be the mayor of New York is narcissism. You just can't be the mayor of New York without being a narcissist. I mean, as long as I've been in New York, they've all been narcissists. You know, and, and, you know, Ed Koch. The tabloid culture. Ed Koch, he was a bit of a, but he was my favorite. Yeah, maybe he was the softest narcissist. <laughs> but he was darling, and he'd walk around town and see people and say, "How am I doing?" Yeah, that's a narcissist comment. That's <laughs> no, that's a sweetheart. I love. I want him for president. Is he still alive? Uh, no. Yeah. Well, I, but there is okay. So maybe it just appeals to narcissists then. Right. But but whatever it is, I mean, there's a tabloid culture, and there is a there's a certain side of Rudy's personality that didn't just like the good fight. It wanted the dramatic fight. It liked it valued character. Character is not character, right? It wanted sort of emblazoned red headlines on the front of the Daily News or the Village Voice or the Post. And also, this is somebody who loves opera, right? He has like this deep love and affinity for opera. All right, so this is somebody who wants to be relevant and he wants to be written about and he wants to be in the center. And he also, you know, had a degree of incredibly precise and good ideas applied at a time that made the city better and also applied in in a specific moment in our world's history that also made the city and the country better. It's almost like he was made for that moment in 9-11. He was made for turning around the city. Sadly, you know, he, he hasn't proven himself to be a man of great character yeah. interpersonally. So we've seen this unraveling, this like right. this big unraveling on the national scene, which has been, you know, its own opera in its own way. You as a identifying Republican woman and what we're seeing happening now, we're, we're sort of moving into our own femsplainer, a little bit political season. Are you a Republican, Danielle? I wouldn't call well, how, uh, what is your now? registration? And be honest, because I'm going to go check it. I'm going to go online. <laughs> I was registered as Republican, but I have not voted Republican in at least two presidential elections. Wait, did you ever I, change your registration? I'm actually probably going to. But I don't want to get into politics, partisanship. I'm a registered Democrat, right. but I don't always vote that but, way. But I, I, sometimes I, don't I wanna, just don't I, vote. I, I don't, don't want to. I don't want to offend our you know listeners who have different political views because that's not what we're here to do. But we are watching. I guess it's. The suburban Republican women who voted for Trump, Steve Bannon is now saying they're lost. And they were kind of important in the election of Trump, correct? No, no, no. Yeah. So somebody's looking at this. By the way, like, I do run a super PAC that is going to be engaged in these congressional fights, of which we have many good Republicans. I, we target Republicans who are strong on LGBT issues, conservatives that are strong on LGBT issues, that believe that there's a way to balance religious freedom with protections for LGBT people. Those are the people that are all going to lose. All these people, I mean, some might call them moderate. I think they're conservative. But they're the ones who are going to lose in this, if there is a tidal wave, a blue tidal wave that sweeps the country. I understand that some people 
like that are just going to stand out this election. If it is indeed going to be a blue tidal wave, if you're a really good, strong, moderate Republican candidate, wait for the 2020. Is that like fair? Or? Yeah, maybe. Or maybe you vote for Democrat. Well, I think. Well, what, what if they? What if they run the Democrats? Run worst case nightmare. Linda Sarsour. <laughs> then what do you do? Right now, it's not so bad that it doesn't appear, at least on the internal polling that I've seen, and and talking to my political peers who are running races and who. Well, I don't. I don't talk to anybody who's running races because I run a super PAC, but independent expenditure crowd. The feeling is that the races are still localized. It is still about who is your member of Congress, do you like them or not, and who is running against them. And the thing is, there have been a record number of women who have been recruited to run. There are really good candidates mm-hmm. that are out there running. And so it's all about where the energy is. I hope and there's no one out there like the me. Republican side going to be in these suburban districts that are R plus three, R plus four, R plus five. They're going to have a really difficult time. This will be a referendum on Trump. It's just that it's a little far out now to be able to tell whether, you know, the few individual cases of what I would call very good Republicans, which are Republicans who have stood up to the president, who you know are, are firmly grounded in their principles and who represent the kind of ideas that we've talked about so far on the show, some of them may still survive um, just because it's, in some cases, case by case. Still. Well, I don't think anybody should make predictions at all ever again. But I just insist on saying this, and I will deny I said it if either of you dare to quote me on it, but I am in Maryland. I don't know really what district I'm in or who's running. And I may not vote. I think Margaret's going to follow up with you after the program. Okay, oh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you really should vote. Yeah, that, that's... in Maryland, I don't know. Uh, you should vote. You have a you have a duty and an obligation as a citizen of the freest nation in the world to vote. I don't. I vote in presidential elections think sometimes. About the people in Venezuela. Think about the people in. Should I quote the president? Uh, <laughs> in, uh, in all these countries that don't have the freedom and the liberty that we have, and it's just it's just. You mean you mean the shithole countries? Sorry. She did not say that. (laughs) You're married to John Avalon, as we've discussed, and you have differing political views. So you're sort of bipartisan couple. Mary Mary? Matlin, James Carville. There's a Carville Matlin going on. Partisan. He thinks he's completely independent straight down the middle, which is ridiculous. (laughs) Um, And I say that to his face. There was a very charming profile of you two recently in the New York Times about your marriage. This is why we're bringing it up. I believe the New York Times said such nice things about a Republican. I really can't. Well, but wait a minute. You're the Republican, and then he's the ne'er do well, non classifiable. What? He's not a Democrat, he's a, he's exactly. He's an independent. Oh, he's an independent. So do you guys fight? Yeah, we try to just focus on the kids. But <laughs> seriously, I mean, we, we, do we disagree? Yeah, a lot, especially on the policy. And then on the politics, he can't vote in primaries. He basically just doesn't like Republicans, and he doesn't like the Republican tradition. Why can't he vote Except in primaries? Except for that, the one that we talked about with Rudy. But his issue is with this racist strain of the conservative movement and the larger part of the conservative movement that made good with it in order to secure political stature. But that's and, fairly recent, and, I mean, in terms of modern. It's like 1964 onward is oh, the okay. he has with the and, Republican And person. he doesn't like Reagan then? No, he, he, he actually, he likes, he likes Reagan. I'd say 60-40, right? Like he, he, he likes winning the Cold War. He likes the articulation of freedom and principles and, mm-hmm. and all the really important stuff that Reagan did. I think he doesn't like some of the things that came with it, right? Mm-hmm. Like he doesn't like, you know, that maybe he wasn't on the right side of apartheid. Not mm-hmm. that he wasn't on the right side of apartheid, but there was a Cold War, right? Mm-hmm. You know, he's quick to see the flaws. So does this is this what you act out in Republicans around the kitchen, like? Somebody's stacking the dishwasher. Someone's, you know, playing with the kids, and you guys are shouting about these politics. the Reagan I mean, legacy. There's, there's, there's <laughs> tribalism that I got. I got tribalism a little bit baked into me too, and so you know, it's something that I have to kind of be. You aware are the of, granddaughter like, of a fine man, Herbert Hoover, and I've read quite a bit about him and realized at a certain point that his memory, I mean, in many cases, was falsified, and he was a victim of fake news. Absolutely. And it was, by, by the way, it wasn't even just fake news. It was a directed and well-funded effort on behalf of Democratic partisans and party men to smear and slander his reputation. Exactly. Um, Hoovervilles and Hoover pants, all of these. Yes, this is a guy named Charlie Michelson, who is an operative of the Democratic National Committee who had a budget of a million dollars in the height of the Depression to besmirch Herbert Hoover. I want to get back to you and John, because I think you can give our listeners something very valuable. Uh, and, and before you do, I just want to say that I was talking to someone very important last night, David Frum. <laughs> and we were she just was talking- at her house for dinner for Russia. <laughs> we were just Donna talking dinner. about it. And I just sort of said, 
your great grandfather and just, you know, he was a very smart guy. Okay, maybe, I mean, I'm not saying he was on the spectrum, but I got kind of a. You know, he actually, I understand what you're saying because his personality wasn't one that could engage with people. Right. But he was mathematically brilliant. And the way that he saved Europe for the famines after the First World War was through algorithms and he knew about roots and he knew about the logistics of he was brilliant and he was an operational genius but he also christina it, it wasn't necessarily on the spectrum although i think it's easy to use our current sort of understanding of it. he was an orphan and so he, he was, was emotionally completely undeveloped of course you're right he lost he his parents when he was nine like his dad when he was six and his mom when he was nine and then he was separated from his two siblings and sent to live with a cantankerous distant quaker uncle. so then he he grew up in this to use common words, an abusive household. Yes. And so he never developed emotionally in a way that children who aren't orphans in the late part of the 19th century who are well-fed and well-cared for and well-loved can. That was a huge impediment to his personality and to his communication throughout his life. Margaret, let's just pause there for a second while we take a quick break. Danielle, did you receive your latest delivery from Scentbird? I did. I got my latest cologne. The brand is Toka, and the scent is Maya. And I'd only known Toka as a makers of candles, candles. beautiful candles and, and room scents, but I didn't realize they had perfume. So I got that this month, and it was absolutely great, but it was hard to choose because there are over 450 designer brands. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> which, which perfume to choose this month? And what I like about it, too, nothing worse than walking through the perfume department and being assaulted. And an often very imperious salesperson. Right. They monitor you, and, you know, and if you want to try on too many, you seem not to like it. Right. I think they come at you like those crop sprayers. That's the thing. <laughs> right. I, I'm right. terrified I'm going to come out smelling like the perfume department. But in any case, if you can't decide which perfume you want, there's an editor-selected cologne of the month. There's also colognes for men. And they come in those beautiful things we keep in our purse, these sleek sort of travel containers. Perfect for travel. I found that if I don't love that scent that month, at least I've gotten to try it. And then I'll do something like I'll spray it on my pillows or my linen. Yeah, it's perfect. You'll spray it on your dog. Is he needs it. <laughs> you know, she runs away when I try. You know, I think well, I train her better. Well, we can't recommend it for dogs. But in any case, you will love it. We highly recommend it. And if you want to try it out, go to scentbird.com. That's scent, S-C-E-N-T, bird.com. And use the code... Femsplain for 50% off. Only $7.50 for your first month. Free shipping. Scentbird.com slash Femsplain. And use my code Femsplain for 50% off your first month. Data cologne before you have to commit to it forever. To go back then to you and John, so if you do have these different tribalisms in the same house, how do you cope with it? How do you deal with it? So you... Um, Don't go to bed angry, as they say. I mean, the the one thing I've learned from my husband, and it's been really hard. It shouldn't be hard, but it is hard. And this is what we don't do with our neighbors, and we don't do with our friends, and we don't do with our family members who like Trump, and we don't like Trump, is assume best intentions, right? And just mm-hmm. assume that people are want the best and are are involved and are engaged because they they're not trying to be jerks. They are coming from a place where they're trying to help and engage in a way that is productive. And you just happen to disagree with how they're doing it or how they think about it. And this is really your mission with Firing Line, right? If we can start reaching out to people and engaging whose ideas we don't necessarily agree with, maybe that's the biggest challenge right now in politics. Yeah, but it's also to contest them, right? Like, we want to expose different ideas. Right. You know, we want to listen to them. But we also want to challenge them, right? I yeah, think. but the assumption of best intentions, I think, is a really profound and, and important And people can point. have good intentions, but bad information. Or bad ideas. Right. Like really twisted ideas. Right, but, but you have to start from the premise that you are both trying to think of the good of the country. And then, yeah, and then maybe they're not, you know, or, you know, you never know. But I, I think that if we're going to get back to any kind of discourse, we need to follow your example, Margaret. Get the well, people I, to engage a, them. Yeah, Very no. admirable. <laughs> that's a heavy burden to carry. But, um, <laughs> hey, William F. Buckley can't yeah. fill your high heels. He can't fill. You're, you're a great femme. You're Manolo now. Manolo Blahnik. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, give that boy next to you, Jack, a big kiss on his head. He was so good. I sure, well, he has just earned an ice cream from the ice cream truck, right? I out. thought oh, there'd be an outburst. In New York City. Much better than Izzy. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of children and creatures are, Christina. I know. <laughs> All right. Love talking to you, Margaret. Thanks she for coming have on. Having me. Really appreciate it. Okay. Good luck with everything. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 You can watch Firing Line with Margaret Hoover on PBS. Go to pbs.org for where to find out your local station and also to watch episodes of it. She's so great. I love it when she gets very wonky. Yes. And, you know, and, and you know her that when you're sitting and having a glass of wine with her, she's just like crazy, hysterical, fun girlfriend. She's like total girlfriend and then political wonk and all mixed in. We didn't ask her a favorite cocktail, but I know what it is. And we didn't ask her about aggravation. Like, oh, that's right. She has a perfect life. She has a perfect Maybe oh. it's better not. But recently she and John came to our house. Actually, they were going to the John McCain funeral and they came the night before and we'd opened a bottle of wine and she walked in. I said, what would you like? And she said, do you have tequila? And I'm thinking, no, but my son, who's 24, might have yeah, upstairs, tequila upstairs some- <laughs> somewhere. I said, oh, no. She goes, okay. And she pulls out a bottle of very fancy tequila, which oh my she brought with girl. her. Oh, she was girl. awesome. But yeah. she drinks it straight? She drinks it straight up. She just drinks tequila? Yeah, she's, she's kind of great. I kind of love her. Yeah, kind of love her. Anyway, that was wonderful. But I told you we had this great mailbag from when we had Vicki Larson on, who wrote about, remember, the seven different types of marriage as an alternative traditional marriage, because traditional marriage is dead, apparently. You can marry yourself. Or you can, you can marry, marry your Izzy. Your, your little multi-poo, which could happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you proposed to me. It got crazy, I have to say. I proposed to you a few times. I know. And that's when we realize you've had too much wine on the show. No, and <laughs> it's true. But anyway, so we got a lot of different views. A lot of them were very actually heartening, and they really reacted well to young Isaac, the intern, who told us why he had proposed at 22 and talked about Julia. Even my mother wrote me and said, oh, that was just, Isaac is so wonderful. Isaac, we miss you. We miss you, Isaac. So we got this, I've got one here from Martin of the UK, another one of our UK listeners. Hello, Martin. Hello, Martin. He says, I'm a UK-based fan. He said, it's great to hear the topics you discuss being debated in a non-partial, respectful way without any of the usual venom that seems to surround most debate on these issues. Yes, we try to be venom-free, Martin. Venom-free. He said, I heard Danielle, I think, saying she didn't believe in love at first sight or the concept of a soulmate, so I thought I would give you my story. Well, actually, that was Vicky who didn't believe in that. Yeah, Vicky didn't believe in it. We believe in it. Totally. Totally. He said, about 20 years ago, me and my then wife moved to a new area and went to a party organized by the local school. Across the room, I saw a woman and immediately felt that woman could have been my soulmate. I'd never met her before, never spoken to her, had no idea what her personality was, but something just told me she was the one. I was happily married at the time. Uh Uh-oh, Martin. Oh, oh, Martin. As was she. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. So never acted on this. Good, Martin. And indeed, never even spoke to her at the party. Fast forward three years, and she'd separated from her husband, and at the same time, my wife announced that she'd been having an affair for a while, and she was leaving me for another man. Another man. Yeah. So I decided to ask her out for a drink as I had nothing to lose. The first date was great, except at one point I forgot myself and said, it will be different when we are married, (laughs) which she was quite taken aback. And I managed to laugh off two to three weeks and three to four dates later, we were so fully on board in agreement that we were absolute soulmates, we're meant to be together. And 15 years later, they remain completely devoted to each other. And every day, he says, oh, I still look at her in the same way as the first time I saw her. Oh, that's so nice, that's right? That's, oh, what that's... a lovely... And of course that happens. But we had another anon splainer. This was a little scary, scary. as our anon splainers Now, the non splainer did say that they love the podcast and look forward to every episode. So on the positive side... Thank okay, you, anon. But I'm writing to you to know that because you made comments, you suggested that people with a two-year-old think, ooh, that's very difficult, but if you wait a few years, it's a short time. I remember you said that when we were talking to Vicky, like people look at people with small children and go, ugh, I don't want that. Yeah, and it lasts a second. Right, so that's what he was reacting to. And he's unhappy about that. I'm sorry, but you left out the other developmental stages, which I don't think are cool, and frankly, no one in their right mind would want unless they feel unfulfilled in life. 
or give in to societal and familial pressures. I love my kids and my spouse, but regret having children. Oh my God. And getting married. I can get that. (laughs) For me, it's a constant challenge of financial instability. No matter what you do or how much I make, it's about compromises that make surviving and being able to save nearly impossible. BS to the notion that life would be better with kids. Mm -hmm. Unless you are well off financially, that's the prerequisite. Children are not toys or pets. They are precarious creatures that you have to form into human beings who might become well-adjusted. Whoa. Ooh. Ooh. I know. Well, first of all, I'm glad I'm not his kid (laughs) or his wife. But I think the thing that stands out in that is he's really upset about his, this feeling of financial burden. Not many people would say, I'd rather have more money than my kids. But he may be in some kind of desperate situation, you know, with a job that he doesn't like. I don't know. Even in desperate situations. Right. No, you, you know, don't. You don't. Maybe the wife, but not the kids ever. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear a comedian that sort oh, yeah. of responded yeah. to him. And I forget his name and it's terrible, but I'll, I'll mangle a joke, but it doesn't matter. So he says, oh, yeah, I don't have kids, but I, my friends are starting to have kids and they have this really cute baby. And they say, oh, it's so great. It's so great. He said, yeah, it's kind of great. But then he said, you know what's really great is not having an effing baby. (laughs) (laughs) Terrible joke. Okay, moving on. I think to get to the point, I mean, maybe this guy is just miserable and we feel for him. And who knows? He got into something. We don't have enough information. But somebody else called Hyperborean over Twitter said, this modern version of traditional marriage is not traditional in the least. And they only want to push it to keep men trapped and provide a role that women prefer while they shirk their own own. So one of the things I was thinking of that is that's kind of a Jordan Peterson-y, there's a lot of guys out there, a lot of them are <laughs> comment to you on Twitter, who feel, I guess, the generous way of looking at this, that the rules were really changed for men and not for women. Does that make sense? That when a woman has a baby, it was supposed to be, oh, we're going to be 50-50, I'm going to go right back to work, and then it doesn't work out that way. And yeah. then a man and it's usually the man, is put back into this situation where he feels he has to carry this deal that he didn't sign up to do. Do you have any patience for that? I do. I don't know. I don't want to generalize, but I sympathize. I can see people get in ruts. I think this idea that it's foreign to men, this concept, that they would have to provide for their child, and it just comes as a big surprise. I mean, somebody like Isaac, who we talked to, wouldn't think that way. That there are a lot of men, young men, who whatever the culture is telling them, think, you know, when I have a kid, I get this is probably going to fall on me a lot. And that's what I'm going to rise to, just as the woman is going to take on a lot of the baby stuff that she maybe didn't think she was going to be taking on, but she will be able to rise to it. I have seen couples, no one I know, no friends, I'm not talking about you. They have babies. Guy works really hard. And she works sort of hard or maybe part-time, but then they share everything 50-50. Right. right. And she's nagging him all the time, and they have huge fights. And Well, this idea that maybe it's been idealized by this ideal notion that we have the 50s, that when the man really had to carry the burden, he right. came home, there was a martini waiting, he read the paper, his wife was in a beautifully starched, crisp dress. That's what were... I would do for you. <laughs> I would do that for you. I'm offering that. You could, I will have... You're actually the one who makes the better I I would think I would be the one in the starch yeah, dress. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I, I get that there's a lot of probably anger about this, and we're not, maybe the problem is we're not really allowed to talk about it as honestly and as frankly as we can. And maybe this is just a warning. Couples, if you're going to get married or be together, these are good things to talk about before. frankly, in advance. We had another love story. Met wife in high school, dated six years before getting married midway through college. Now we've been married 13 years and together over half our lives and two small children. This is what he says that's really interesting. It's tough to be married in college because that is a time where you should be totally selfish about your education. And there were rough times. Also for men, I've learned your brain isn't fully developed until (laughs) you're in your late 20s. So I get why people say to wait. After college, we were different people, but luckily we grew and matured together. It's a nice story. It's a nice story. So maybe anonymous is... Too young. Maybe his brain has to grow. (laughs) Now we have our new intern, Zoe here, who is beautiful and brilliant and adorable and has a boyfriend. I do. And a differently proportioned cat. 
Yes, he weighs 20 pounds. His name is Squash. <laughs> He's a rescue. <laughs> and he is quite large, yes. <laughs> Does he like to play with multi <laughs> I Actually, I haven't introduced him to other animals yet. So what is your reaction to these comments? And So my, my boyfriend and I actually just celebrated our year and a half anniversary on Can you tell your age? Sunday. So? I'm 22. Okay. And we both are kind of in it for the long haul. We live together already. We're both seniors at AU. So this is your senior year? Yeah. And actually, I graduate in December, actually, so my last semester. And you're already living together? Yeah. I kind of had the love at first sight thing. It took a little bit longer on his end. But yeah, we've, we've been together for a long time, and we're both pretty comfortable. We both want to be lawyers. We both want to be litigators specifically, so our career path is very similar, and we've we've both definitely talked about it. So I actually went to high school with a lot of people that have gotten engaged pretty young. That's, That's coming back. That's a yeah. thing. Yeah, and I, I did a, a summer program here in D.C. with a lot of people that were either postgraduates or seniors in college this year, and one of the girls was getting married two weeks after the program ended, and oh, she had wow. just graduated and was starting law school in the fall. Oh, so the 1950s are coming back, and that's not a bad thing, because we'll do it well, with a new consciousness well, and a new yeah, awareness. We don't want it to be the 1950s. No, we're not right, going right. to have the sexism and the racism anyway. and the classism. Yeah, but I think new, the millennials, or the, you're actually not a millennial, you are an iGen. So it's, I'm it's, 96. I was born in 96. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, like, I don't know the God, cutoff. Born in 96? I don't know. But yeah, I think I think young marriage is making a comeback a little bit. I sort of surround myself in conservative and libertarian <laughs> circles. So a lot of the people I know are conservative that are getting engaged younger. I can't Which, say. Whereas I think the older millennials, those in their late 20s, are not. Yeah. And maybe that's also because they graduated, from, you know, during the worst recession. So maybe even the economy. I think the helping. economy has something to do with it. That could right. be true. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are comfortable with the idea of now that I think more women are obviously going to college and to, you know, law school or grad school than they were in the 1950s. I think a lot of couples mm -hmm. are comfortable being in school together for a long period of time. I know my boyfriend and I are. Okay, well, Zoe, keep us posted. Keep yes, us posted. <laughs> um, and, and Izzy and Squash, we got to make that <laughs> happen. A play date. Yeah. <laughs> this is a tiny thing, and then we have one more thing before we end, but this tiny thing was, remember we had that conversation about ghosts in chains after Sally Quinn podcast? I will never forget it. And now <laughs> I've, I've actually heard ghosts in chains in my <laughs> attic. And I'm frightened and I... Well, I had said that, you know, in looking into it, that they really came in vogue in the Victorians. And until then, there wasn't, you know, real evidence of ghosts <laughs> <laughs> habitually haunting in chains. Yeah, this is what just makes us love our listeners. Many of them are just so brilliant. So one guy pointed out that in Pliny the Younger, Letters to Sura, there was a ghost that appeared in chains. He lived from 62 AD to 113 AD, Roman era. And he quotes, this is in the letter to Sura, there was at Athens a large and roomy house which had a bad name so that no one could live there. In the dead of the night, a noise resembling the clashing of iron was frequently heard, which, if you listened more attentively, sounded like the rattling of chain. <gasps> oh, my God. So it goes back. And then on that note, Christina, this is maybe one of the oddest questions we've had. Is it a proposal to me? No. Because I get a few of those. Oh, there was one. We're, to, we're talking about that next time. Because okay. there okay. was... I think a 73-year-old. I'm not MILF. Now I'm GILF, and I don't know what that means. 73-year-old <laughs> we'll discuss later. Oh, 73? Uh? Well, that was kind of like a scary bedtime story, right? Okay, so here is one we got from Lisa. Hello, Lisa. She says, I've enjoyed your podcast. Thank you. I just have one question. Since I sometimes listen to the conversations a second time after 9 p.m., do you think you could end the podcast with a lullaby? She goes to bed at 9? Hey, don't knock that. What time do you go to bed? Like 7.30. Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> I, we won't even discuss that. I go to bed at 2 or 3 a.m. So. No, I'm, I'm in, I'm in yeah, bed at 9. So, it, Lisa, I'm with you. She wants a lullaby. All right. Okay, so okay. What, what was a lullaby you sang to your kids? I always sang Sweet Low Sweet Chariot. Did you ever sing that? Never, but I'll sing it. Remember the little baby sack on your shoulder? Oh, little sweetheart. Little, that little wannabe. heavy pudding yes. you could have yes, on your shoulder. Yes, darling. Are, Lisa, are you in bed? Are you in bed? Are you tucked in? Okay. Swing, swing low. low. Hang on. Swing, swing, 
Swing low, sweet cherry eye, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet cherry eye, coming for to carry me home. Bonsoir. I look at the John.